Hello to everyone. Welcome to Be Rich, our in-depth study on the letter to the Ephesians. And it's the last session. So today I'm going to talk about you're in the army now. And it is Ephesians 6, ending up the scripture verses from 10 to 24. This is your pastor, Yeti. I remember, you are loved with an everlasting love. So, for the newcomers, there are 13 sessions from the letters, the letter to to the Ephesians. So, if you are having the courage to take it on, I will encourage you to say, yes, do it, because it's very interesting how rich you are in Christ. Sooner or later, every believer discovers that the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground, and that he faces an enemy who is much stronger than he is apart from the Lord. That Paul should use the military to illustrate the believer's conflict with Satan is reasonable. He himself was chained to a Roman soldier, and his readers were certainly familiar with soldiers and the equipment they used. In fact, military illustrations were favorites with Paul. As Christians, we face three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. (coughs) The world refers to the system around us that is opposed to God, that caters to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Society apart from God is a simple but accurate definition of the world. The flesh is the old nature that we inherit from Adam, a nature that is opposed to God and can do nothing spiritual to please God. By his death, Excuse me. By his death and resurrection, Christ overcame the world and the flesh and the devil. In other words, as believers, we do not fight for victory, we fight from victory. Sometimes it's so many people do it reverse, they fight against. No, we fight from victory because Christ finished it on the cross <coughs> excuse me the spirit of God enables us by faith to appropriate Christ's victory for ourselves in these closing verses of the letter Paul discussed four topics so that his readers by understanding and applying these truths might walk in victory. The first one, the enemy, 6, 12, uh, 10 to 12. The intelligence corps plays a vital part in warfare because it enables the officers to know and understand the enemy, unless we know who the enemy is, where he is, and what he can do. We have a difficult time defeating him, not only in Ephesians 6, but throughout the entire Bible. God instructs us about the enemy, so there is no reason for us to be caught off guard. The leader, the devil, the enemy, has many different names. Devil means accuser, because he accuses God's people day and night, before the throne of God. Satan means adversary. 
because he is the enemy of God. He is also called the tempter and the murderer and the liar. He is compared to a lion, a serpent, and an angel of light, as well as the God of this age. Where did he come from, this spirit creature that seeks to oppose God and defeat his work? Many students believe that in the original creation he was Lucifer, the son of the morning, Isaiah 14, 12 to 15, and that he was cast down because of his pride and his desire to occupy God's throne. Many mysteries are connected with the origin of Satan, but what he is doing and where he is going are certainly no mystery. Since he is a created being and not eternal as God is, he is limited in his knowledge and activity. Unlike God, Satan is not allowing all powerful or everywhere present. Then how does he accomplish so much in so many different parts of the world? The answer is in his organized helpers. Satan's helpers, Paul called them principalities, powers, rulers, spiritual wickedness in high places. You can read that in Ephesians 6 verse 12. The Apostle John hinted that one-third of the angels fell with Satan when he rebelled against God. And Daniel wrote that Satan's angels struggled against God's angels for control of the affairs of the nations. Daniel 10, 13-20 A spiritual battle is going on in this world and in the sphere of the heavenlies and you and I are a part of this battle. Knowing this makes walking in victory a vitally important thing to us and to God. The important point is that our battle is not against human beings. It is against spiritual powers. We are wasting our time fighting people when we ought to be fighting the devil, who seeks to control people and make them oppose the work of God. During Paul's ministry in Ephesus, a riot took place that could have destroyed the church, Acts 19, 21 to 41. He wasn't, it wasn't caused only by Demetrius and his associates, for behind them were Satan and his associates. Certainly Paul and the church prayed and the opposition was silenced. The advice of the king of Syria to his soldiers can be applied to our spiritual battle. Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king. 1 Kings 22 to verse 31. Satan's abilities. The admonitions Paul gave indicate that Satan is a wrong enemy and that we need the power of God to be able to stand against him. Never underestimate the power of the devil. He is not compared to a lion and a dragon just for fun. The book of Job tells what his power can do to a man's body, home, wealth, and friends. Jesus called Satan a thief who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Not only is Satan strong, but he is also wise and subtle. And we fight against the wiles of the devil. Wiles means cunning, crafty arts, stratagems. The Christian cannot afford to be ignorant of his devices. Some men are cunning and crafty and lie in wait to deceive. 
but behind him is the arch deceiver, Satan. He masquerades as an angel of light. 2. The Equipment Since we are fighting against enemies in the spirit world, we need spiritual equipment both for offenses and defense. God has provided the whole armor for us, and we dare not omit any part. Satan looks for that unguarded area where he can get a beach hat. Paul commanded his readers to put on the armor, take the weapons, and withstand Satan, all of which we do by faith. Knowing that Christ has already conquered Satan and that his spiritual armor and weapons are available. By faith, we accept what God gives us and go out to meet the foo. The day is evil and the enemy is evil, but if God be for us, who can be against us? The breastplate the breastplate of righteousness. This piece of armor made of metal, plates, or chains covered the body from the neck to the waist, both front and back. It symbolizes the believer's righteousness in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.21, as well as his righteous life in Christ, Ephesians 4.24. Satan is the accuser but he cannot accuse a believer who is living a godly life in the power of Christ. The life we live either fortifies us against Satan's attacks or makes it easier for him to defeat us. When Satan accuses a Christian, it is the righteousness of Christ that assures the believer of his salvation. But our positional righteousness in Christ without practical righteousness is a daily life only gives Satan opportunity to attack us. The Shoes of the Gospel, verse 15. The Roman soldier wore sandals with Hop nails in the soles to give him better footing for the battle. If we are going to stand and withstand, then we need the shoes of the gospel. Because we have the peace with God that comes from the gospel, we need not fear, t- we need not fear the attack of Satan or man. We must be at peace with God and with each other if we are to defeat the devil. But the shoes have another meaning. We must be prepared each day to share the gospel of peace with the lost world. The most victorious Christian is a witnessing Christian. If we wear the shoes of the gospel, then we have the beautiful feet mentioned in Isaiah 52 verse 7 and Romans 10 15. Satan has declared war, but you and I are ambassadors of peace. And as such, we take the gospel of peace wherever we go. The shield of faith, verse 16. The shield was large, usually about four feet by two feet, made of wood and covered with tough leather. <clears throat> As the soldier held it before him, it protected him from spears, arrows, and fiery darts. The edges of these shields were so constructed that an entire line of soldiers could interlock shields and march into the enemy like a solid wall. This suggests that we Christians are not in the battle alone. The faith mentioned here is not saving faith, but rather living faith, a trust in the promises and the power of God. 
Fate is a defensive weapon that protects us from Satan's fiery darts. In Paul's days, arrows dipped in some inflammable substance and ignited were shot at the enemy. And Satan shoots fiery darts at our hearts and minds. Lies, blasphemous thoughts, heart, hateful thoughts about others, doubts and burning desires for sin. If we do not by faith quench these darts, they will light a fire within and we will disobey God. We never know when Satan will shoot a dart at us. So we must always walk by faith and use the shield of faith. The helmet of salvation, verse 17. Satan wants to attack the mind the way he defeats Eve. The helmet refers to the mind controlled by God. It is too bad that many Christians have the idea that the intellect is not important. When, in reality, it plays a vital role in Christian growth, service, and victory. When God controls the mind, Satan cannot lead the believer astray. The Christian who studies his Bible and learns the meaning of Bible doctrines is not going to be led astray too easily. We need to be thought by him, and the truth is in Jesus. We are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The sword of the Spirit, for 17b. This sword is the offensive weapon God provides us. The Roman soldier wore on his griddle a short sword which was used for close in fighting. Hebrews 4, verse 12, compares the word of God to a sword because it is sharp and is able to pierce the inner man just as a material sword pierces the body. You and I were cut to the heart when the word convinced us of our sins. And Peter tried to use his sword to defend Jesus in the garden. But he learned at Pentecost that the sword of the Spirit does a much better job. Moses also tried to conquer with a physical sword, only to discover that God's word alone was more than enough to defeat Egypt. The energy. 6, 18 to 20. Prayer is the energy that enables the Christian soldier to wear the armor and wield the sword. We cannot fight the battle in our own power. No matter how strong or talented we may think we are when Amalek attacked Israel, Moses went the mountaintop to pray while Joshua used the sword down in the valley. It took both to defeat Amalek, Moses' intercession on the mountain, and Joshua uses of the sword in the valley. Prayer is the power for victory, but not just any kind of prayer. Paul told how to pray if he would defeat Satan. Pray always. This obviously does not mean always saying prayers. We are not heard for our church are much speaking. Pray without ceasing. Says to us, always be in communion with the Lord. Keep the receiver of the hook. Never have to say when you pray, Lord, we come into your presence because you never left his presence. A Christian must pray always because he is always subject to temptations and attacks of the devil. Pray with all prayer. There is more than one kind of praying, prayer, supplication, intercession, and thanksgiving. The believer who prays only to ask for things is missing out on blessings that come with intercessions and giving of thanks. In fact, Thanksgiving is a great prayer weapon for defeating Satan. Praise changes things 
as much as prayer changes things. Intercession for others can bring victory to our own lives. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Pray in the Spirit. The Bible formula is that we pray to the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit. Romans 8, 26-27 tells us that only in the Spirit's power can we pray in the will of God. Otherwise, our praying could be selfish and out of the will of God. In the Old Testament tabernacle, there was a small golden altar standing before the veil, and here the priest burned the incense. Exodus 30, verses 1 to 10, and Luke 1, 1 to 11. The incense is a picture of prayer. It had to be mixed according to God's plan. and could not be counterfeited by man. The fire on the altar is a picture of the Holy Spirit, for it is He who takes our prayers and ignites them in the will of God. Pray with your eyes open. Watching means keeping on the alert. The phrase watch and pray occurs often in the Bible. When Nehemiah was repairing the walls of Jerusalem and the enemy was trying to stop the work, Nehemiah defeated the enemy by watching and praying. Nevertheless, we make our prayer unto our God and set a watch. Watch and pray is the secret of victory over the world. Peter went to sleep when he should have been praying and the result was victory for Satan. God expects us to use our God-given senses, led by the Spirit, so that we detect Satan when he is beginning the work. Keep on praying. The word perseverance simply means to stick to it and not quit. The early believers prayed this way, and we also should pray this way. Perseverance in prayer does not mean we are trying to twist God's arm, but rather that we are deeply concerned and burdened and cannot rest until we get God's answer. Pray with for all the saints. The Lord's Prayer begins with our Father, not my Father. We pray as part of a great family that is also talking to God, and we ought to pray for the other members of the family. Even Paul asked for the prayer support of the Ephesians, and he had been to the third heaven and back. If Paul needed the prayers of the saints, how much more do you and I need them? If my prayers help other believers defeat Satan, then that victory will help me too. Note, that Paul did not ask them to pray for his comfort or safety, but for the effectiveness of his witness and ministry. And the fourth one, the encouragement, 6, 21 to 24. We are not fighting the battle alone. There are other believers who stand with us in the fight, and we ought to be careful to encourage one another. Paul encouraged the Ephesians, Tychicus was an encouragement to Paul, and Paul was going to send Tychicus to Ephesus to be an encouragement to him. Paul was not the kind of missionary who kept his affairs to himself. He wanted the people of God to know what God was doing, how their prayers were being answered, and what Satan was doing to oppose the work. His motives was not selfish. He was not trying to get something out of them. What an encouragement it is to be a part of the family of God. Nowhere in the New Testament do we find an isolated believer. Christians are like sheep. They flock together. The church is an army and the soldiers need to stand 
together and fight together. Note, the words Paul used as he closes this letter, peace, love, faith, grace. He was a prisoner of Rome, yet he was richer than the emperor, no matter what our circumstances may be. In Jesus Christ, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings. I give you one question. The Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? And why? So we close up this last session of the letter to the Ephesians. It's a well done in that study. Please use it. It's for your own benefits and for the benefits of your friends and your church. This is not the end of my podcast. So very short, I will give you a new one. It will be probably next week. But in the meantime, I wish you all a blessed day and an upcoming weekend. May God be with you as your journey. And may God also be the blessings giving to you that you need as you walk and study and pray. And may the peace of God be with you and stays with you. And may his light shine upon you and keep you safe. Have a good day wherever you are on this globe. Enjoy life. Your life in Christ is rich. You are very rich. God bless. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye-bye.